Thank you, Maria. Um, the hearing will come to order. First, I'd like to apologize to my colleagues and the witnesses. I'm at the Space Symposium in Colorado, so I feel like I'm experiencing almost a week-long space hearing. I would like to welcome the extraordinary witnesses we have today. Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, Dr. John Plum, Director of the National Reconnaissance Office, Dr. Christopher Scalise, Commander of Space Systems Command, Lieutenant General Michael Gutlein, the Deputy Director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Ms. Tanya Wilkerson, and GAO Director of Contracting and National Security Acquisitions, Mr. John Ludwigsgun. We're honored to have this level of expertise with the department and the intelligence community testifying today on one of the most important topics that we will cover in this Congress. And we're always glad to have our friends from GAO. Both Dr. Plum and Lieutenant General Goodline are joining us today in new positions which highlight the shift within the department, focus on space policy and acquisition. We look forward to the Senate moving forward with the nomination of Mr. Frank Calvelli to fill the role of Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration and to further this important emphasis. Uh, I hope that the Senate will move quickly on that. Given what we've witnessed in space by our adversaries this year, including a destructive and irresponsible anti-satellite test conducted by Russia, and China's demonstration of the ability to grapple another satellite and pull it out of orbit, we cannot be too bold or aggressive in demonstrating our intent and ability to defend our assets in space. The President's budget is the first time we've seen a shift toward more uh, resilient and robust space architecture. Further, the request by the President for development and procurement for satellite capabilities in fiscal year 2023 is $27.6 billion, the largest for these types of programs that we've ever seen and a more than 25% increase from last year's request. I'm very encouraged by these numbers and perhaps the fact that the Department of Defense has finally come to see what we have been trying to highlight for the last several years, that space is no longer a benign domain we must be prepared to defend our assets on orbit and maintain the ability to use space in support of global combatant commanders. While I do have optimism on uh, that, that the tide is turning in our direction, or perhaps we should say orbits are coming closer to what we'd like to see, we are shifting toward a greater recognition of the critical role of space in our daily lives. Uh, every citizen of the planet should be aware of that. I'm also uh, faced with the reality that there still seem to be some far more offices within the Pentagon that can say no to space procurement than can say yes. And across the space acquisition community, there is a continued reticence to change. We have come a long way, but there's still much work to do. We have the opportunity to make real change by an acquisition culture that has been mired in cost overruns, schedule delays, and delivery capabilities that are not adequately survivable against increasingly significant threats. I'd like to turn now to the ranking member, Mr. Lamborn, who I just saw a day or two ago here in Colorado, for any re opening remarks that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can appreciate wanting, your wanting to spend as much time as you can in Colorado Springs. It was great seeing you Monday at the Space Symposium. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our panel of witnesses here today. Thank you all for your service to our nation. I have to say that Chairman Cooper is the smartest one of us all because he is there in Colorado Springs at the Space Symposium while we're all stuck here in DC. <laughs> I want to particularly welcome Dr. Plum and Lieutenant General Gutlein to their new positions as was mentioned a minute ago. I'm excited to finally see that these space positions are being filled out with permanent folks. We have a lot of work to do and our adversaries are moving quickly to blunt the national security advantages we enjoy because of our space systems. The threats we see from China and Russia have only increased since we had this hearing last year. China has demonstrated on orbit the ability to grapple with another satellite and drag it into another orbit. Russia has demonstrated a ground-launched anti-satellite weapon against one of its own satellites, resulting in a dangerous field of debris that the world is still dealing with. These are just the public examples of China and Russia pushing for dominance in space. Their efforts are especially concerning when considering the provocative actions they are taking in other domains. Top of mind for all of us is Russia's unprovoked 
invasion of Ukraine that has resulted in the indis indiscriminate deaths of thousands of civilians. These are the actions of countries that only respond to hard power. In space, that means not only increasing resiliency of future systems, but also having a plan to defend our space assets currently on orbit. Let's speak plainly. China and Russia have already weaponized space. The question left to us is, what are we going to do about it? More than 10,000 military and civilian space professionals from around the world are gathered in Colorado Springs this week, the epicenter of global space operations. These experts are trying to answer that question for us, and they need our policy support. I would love to hear from you all today how we are planning to get to this resilient architecture. How are you all working together to make sure that we have a whole of government approach when it comes to national security space? How are we designing deterrence for space in the hope of maintaining peace? I hope you are thinking about it differently than we have in the past, including how demonstrated rapid reconstruction and reusable space vehicles could support deterrence. But hope is not a plan, and it is time to move beyond hope. I was pleased to see that the new national defense strategy continues to highlight the importance of space as a war-fighting domain. We must move past these strategy documents, though, into programs of record, get systems on orbit, and take responsibility for the area of space we depend on so greatly. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Lamborn. Uh, our first witness will be Dr. Plum. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Lamborn, members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today on national security space programs. As your first ever Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, I am responsible by law for the overall supervision of the policy of the Department of Defense for space warfighting. And I am committed to continuing the close partnership between DOD and the Congress on advancing our national security space interests. As the Chairman said, space plays a critical role in American security, prosperity, and our way of life. It contributes to our national security by enabling and supporting the entire joint force, our service members on land, at sea, and in the air relay on space every single day to defend the nation. Space capabilities provide indications and warning of emerging threats and attacks. They deliver the position, navigation, and timing signals that support rapid and precise global power projection. Space systems generate intelligence on operationally relevant timelines and allow national decision makers to anticipate risks and to control or de-escalate crises. Space also enables those same decision makers to command and control forces in multiple theaters around the globe. And space is once again capturing the imagination of a new generation of Americans. This can inspire more students to pursue careers in the STEM disciplines, paying dividends to our national economy and national security in the future. Secretary Austin has made clear that China is the department's pacing challenge, and this holds true in space as it does in other domains. The U.S. developed our space architecture in an era when space was more or less a sanctuary. In contrast, over the past decade, China has dramatically increased its quantity and quality of space and counter space systems in order to develop and field a wartime space architecture. This requires the United States to consider new approaches to ensuring our own use of space including developing more proliferated and therefore more resilient constellations of our own. Russia also remains a key space competitor. They are developing, testing, and fielding counter space weapons to target U.S. and allied satellites. And as the ranking member just noted, the Rus Russia conducted a destructive test of a direct ascent ASAT missile in November of last year. This created more than 1,500 pieces of trackable debris hundreds of thousands of smaller pieces, all of which pose a threat to safe space operations in low Earth orbit. This behavior is unbefitting of a spacefaring nation. In contrast, the Department of Defense is committed to promoting standards and norms of responsible behavior to ensure the space domain remains secure, stable, and accessible. As the Deputy Secretary of Defense stated at the December National Space Council meeting, the Department would like to see all nations agree to refrain from anti-satellite weapons testing that creates debris. I just want to touch on the budget for a second. The DOD's fiscal year 2023 national security space budget does provide the 27.6 billion in vital space capabilities that were mentioned. Uh, this includes 4.7 billion to fund a transition to a new and resilient missile warning and missile track architecture, 1.8 billion to fund the procurement of two GPS-3 follow-on satellites, 
and to continue testing and integration of military GPS user equipment. $1.6 billion to develop secure, survivable, and jam-resistant SATCOM capabilities. And $1.6 billion to procure six national security space launches. So just to wrap up, the threats facing the United States in space and from space continue to grow in both quantity and capability. The President's budget request takes that into account. Countering those threats requires that we continue the longstanding bipartisan cooperation between the Department of Defense and the Congress. I personally am committed to sustaining those efforts, and I'm honored to work with this committee to do so. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Plum. Now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Scalise. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, uh, Ranking Member Lamborn, uh, and members of the subcommittee. It's a great honor to to represent the people of the National Reconnaissance Office and share the efforts to deliver critical information to policymakers, warfighters, and the half million users we serve every day. For more than 60 years, the vision of the NRO has been to see it, hear it, sense it. We have built an amazing advantage in space, developing, acquiring, launching, and operating satellites that collect and deliver the best intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance data on the planet. Yet I can tell you it's an unprecedented time for the NRO. The pace of technology is accelerating, creating opportunities for both governments and private sector. Satellites are being launched in record numbers. Our competitors, especially China and Russia, are trying to challenge our advantage in space, dedicating money, manpower, and resources, including newer, better weapons and anti-satellite technology. Simply put, it is imperative that we protect our assets and expand our competitive edge. The United States has never before been more reliant on our capabilities in space. Our national security and our modern way of life depend on it. Our imagery has proven invaluable to government agencies and commercial users that track everything from natural disasters to crop production to climate change. Of course, what's most important to our national security and the work of this subcommittee is the support we provide to the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. The NRO provides accurate, timely intelligence to warfighters and policymakers. We monitor what is happening globally, even in hostile territories and terrain that would not be accessible by any other way to support the analytic and policy community. This informs strategy and prevents miscalculation. NRO capabilities provide customers with global and regional capacity and assured access. This helps them to maintain a strategic advantage against near-peer competitors it also helps them focus on ways to counter rogue regimes and regional and transnational threats. We are developing systems faster, launching 17 payloads into orbit over the last two years. We are leveraging commercial technologies and fielding systems in as little as 18 months. Those systems are returning immediate dividends, providing awareness in real-world crisis events. With innovative and streamlined contracting approaches, we are moving faster in our acquisition processes with both traditional industry and new entrants into the marketplace. To accelerate and focus our progress, earlier this year we, ref we refreshed the NRO's strategic priorities. These updates reflect the new challenges we face in space and the shifting strategic environment. The five priorities that guide our mission, including growing an empowered, engaged, and inclusive workforce, innovating faster to stay ahead of our competitors, delivering responsible and, and agile ISR, bolstering resiliency, and cultivating mission-enhancing partnerships. Additional details on these are, are provided in my statement for the record. Mr. Chairman, the NRO is at a pivotal moment. For 60 years, America's dominance in space was largely unchallenged. That's not the case anymore. Space has quickly turned from peaceful to competitive and has the potential to become conflicted. The future depends on our ability to protect our assets and stay ahead of our competitors. In short, it depends on our ability to innovate and to continue to attract highly motivated and capable people. Using these five priorities as our guide, I am confident the NRO is up to the challenge to do whatever is necessary and all that is possible. We will continue to deliver on our motto, motto super at ultra, above and beyond. Thank you for your continued support. Chairman Cooper, I would especially like to express my appreciation for your ongoing leadership in space-based national security 
and for your advocacy of the NRO over the years. I welcome the subcommittee's questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Scalise. We'll now hear from Lieutenant General Goodline. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Lamborn, and members of the committee. On behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Frank Kendall III, and General John W. J. Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department of the Air Force's National Security Space Programs. It's an honor to, be, to appear before you and to testify alongside these esteemed space professionals. As Secretary Kendall and General, General Raymond have stated and as highlighted by Chairman Cooper and Ranking Member Lamborn and the witnesses that have gone before me today, our adversaries are committed to disrupting our strategic advantage in space during crisis and in conflict. We cannot afford to wait. We must be prepared and we must act now. As the Space Force Field Command charged with supplying space and naval capabilities like position, navigation, and timing, satellite communications, missile warning, and command and control to the Joint Force, we have aggressively taken steps to address acquisition challenges while building resilient architectures of tomorrow and delivering the critical capabilities of today. We are rapidly ushering in a new era of space acquisition. In the eight months since our inception, we've coupled the agility of the Rapid Capabilities Office with the flat, agile organizational structure of the National Reconnaissance Office and the systems engineering rigor of the Missile Defense Agency. By doing this, we built Space Systems Command upon the best practices from across the national space acquisition enterprise. We've adopted and exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build only what we must approach to acquisitions. By exercising unity of effort across the space enterprise through building and leveraging partnerships with other government agencies, industry, academia, the civil community, and our allies, we are able to build in resiliency into the space enterprise and build a, de a deterrent network that transcends national borders and bolsters American security and prosperity. As the major acquisition arm of the Space Force, we are partnered with the new Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration to employ a new acquisition paradigm that promises to cut years off the front end of the traditional acquisition cycle. This efficiency will only improve as the Space Force moves forward with our digital transformation. This transformation will deliver winds of increasing magnitude, delivering better capabilities sooner, and will evolve the Space Force into the world's first digital service. While we aren't there yet, we have made several improvements across the command and across the space enterprise that are already bringing successes for tomorrow's fight while delivering capabilities today. The entire Space Force, and especially Space Systems Command, are laser focused on countering the rising space threat, and we are dedicated to protecting our joint maritime land and air forces. I want to thank the committee for their steadfast support and their devotion to progress as evidenced by your continued challenge to the Space Force and to the Department of the Air Force to lead these improvements. We are deeply committed to the success of all national security space programs and securing our nation's vital interests. And I look forward to answering your questions today. Thank you. Thank you so much, General. Uh, we'll now hear from Ms. Wilkerson. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Lamborn, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is the nation's primary provider of geospatial intelligence, or GEOINT, which is the use of imagery and geospatial information to describe and depict features, activities, and locations on and about the Earth. We help decision makers, warfighters, and first responders visualize and understand what is happening at a particular place at a particular time. Each of these partners rely on us to show the way literally, to get them from point A to point B, help illuminate options, inform decisions, and carry out actions with precision. Indeed, GEOINT has been a central element of our nation's understanding of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. I have some additional materials to discuss in the closed session, but would note here that NGA is closely monitoring events in Ukraine while we provide partners across the globe access to numerous sources of intelligence including commercial space-based imagery. Beyond current events, NGA and our predecessor organizations have a long history of supporting our nation's space intelligence needs and activities. Earth's orbit is no longer a benign environment. 
and the threat to U.S. national security interests from foreign space powers is real and growing. Our adversaries are not standing still, and neither is NGA. In order to expand our GON advantage in all realms, including space, NGA is focused on our people, partnerships, and preparation for the missions of today and tomorrow. First, people. We are increasing our investments in developing our tradecraft and training and expert workforce across the community to perform analysis on space issues. For instance, NGA established a program in 2021 to teach fundamentals of space and counter space analysis to students across DOD, IC, and allied partners. Second, partnerships. NGA continues to expand our partnerships with the U.S. government, industry, and allied partners. Within the space domain, NRO is our lead partner in advancing space-based geoint capabilities, including the acquisition of pixels from new commercial sources. In direct support of the Space Intelligence Mission, NGA has long maintained support teams at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center and the Missiles and Space Intelligence Center. More recently, we established a support team at Spacecom in 2019 and one for U.S. Space Force in November of 2021. These embedded teams substantially deepen the level of collaboration between the organizations. Finally, our mission. Space is vitally important to NGA's mission. It is the environment in which the sensors that provide much of our GEOINT data operate. Our adversaries and peer competitors have the means to deny us that resource, so NGA remains committed to supporting our warfighters in space. Additionally, NGA is the global leader in providing geosciences data and support for positioning, navigation, and timing. Everything that depends on knowing exactly where and when something is on or around the Earth uses this unique form of geoint. As such, NGA is focused on ensuring the integrity and resiliency of these capabilities. In conclusion, NGA continues to evolve our space intelligence mission to meet current and future needs. We remain focused on protecting U.S. national security interests in the space domain to deter, protect, and defeat our adversaries in space. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilkerson. And now we'll hear from Mr. Ludwigson. Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Lamborn, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss GEO's work examining. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, GEO's work examining DOD's national security space programs. Space has long provided the ultimate high ground, and the U.S. has made broad use of it. DOD develops space systems that provide communications facilitate real-time global insights and other key capabilities. Those capabilities provided the U.S. with decades of advantages. However, we live in a challenging and competitive world. Space systems operate in a difficult environment and at the leading edge of the possible. As such, space assets do not last forever and systems risk being overcome by technology advances. Our potential adversaries have also taken note of our space-based capabilities and made clear that they intend to hold our assets at risk and use space for their own purposes. As a result, Congress faces important questions about how to recapitalize capabilities, add new ones, and address risks to our space systems. All of this in the face of short time frames, difficult technical challenges, and limited budgets. Over the years, GAO has reviewed DOD's development of numerous space systems. Often, we found that the new systems took longer and cost more than expected, and sometimes fell short of planned capabilities. My written statement provides an update on several programs, including our September 2021 report on the Next Generation OPIR program that identified steps aimed at accelerating the program, but found, among other things, that the program faced significant technical and management challenges, which could make it difficult to meet its aggressive schedule, and DOD did not make the schedule risks clear in its reporting. These kinds of aggressive schedules mirror themes from our past work. Also, our September 2021 report on the MUOS program found that DOD was not using the full capabilities of the new system with satellites on orbit, the full constellation for over five years, in large part due to a lack of compatible user terminals. This left the services relying on the oversubscribed legacy capability, which faces near-term risks of losing the satellites that support it. 
We also found that the department had not begun to plan for the eventual replacement of MUOs. Again, the lack of alignment between segments and late planning have been themes of our past work. Looking ahead, DOD faces several broad challenges and opportunities for developing and fielding space systems, and we're examining some of them. First, DOD has made progress in the stand-up of Space Force, the first new service in decades, having already moved thousands of military and civilian personnel, created new organizations and lines of authority, among other accomplishments. As we noted last year, the stand-up of the Space Force could help address the challenges that we've highlighted in the past, including divided leadership, but could also present growing pains if not managed well. We remain watchful but encouraged with the progress. Second, the world has borne witness to the rapid rise of a commercial space industry. This rise creates complications but also provides opportunities. The dramatic increase of satellites on orbit has increased the need to track and understand the movements of these objects and to take steps to mitigate risks as needed. Of particular note, the rising use of low Earth orbit by commercial companies comes as DOD plans to enhance its use of this orbit. However, the burgeoning commercial industry provides more options for DOD to procure commercial data and services to complement DODs or, in place of DOD, developing its own systems. We're examining opportunities and challenges DOD faces on this front. Third, our potential adversaries have demonstrated their capability to target objects in space. Recognizing that our space-based capabilities are at risk has prompted the department to develop new tools to monitor for threats and other tools for operating in this rapidly changing threat environment. We're examining those efforts. Finally, balancing efforts to enhance acquisition authorities to improve outcomes while ensuring opportunities for effective oversight remains important. Clearly, we support DOD's efforts to enhance its record on space acquisitions. However, some will point to paperwork as the cause of the slow, the slow process. I reprise my call to follow our leading practices and preserve what I call the first principles behind the paperwork to build strong programs and the ability to oversee them. Space systems are surely important to DOD's mission, but going fast cannot be the only goal. Congress must have the opportunity for meaningful oversight. We continue to examine acquisition reform and related proposals, as well as monitoring programs using these approaches. Chairman Cooper, Ranking Member Lamborn, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions the subcommittee members may have. Thank you, Mr. Ludwitzkam. I would like to uh, thank all of the witnesses, and I would like to ask my colleagues to uh, try to uh, fit this public session in before we have votes on the floor. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, but if every member could respect um, the short overall period of time, that would help. Um, I wish I could join you for the closed session. Unfortunately, I will not be able to. My only question for the panel would be for Ms. Wilkerson. I know you're going to talk about this more in closed session, but what can you say in public session about the uh, war in Ukraine and the spectacular use of imagery that we see on television almost every night, whether from the government or from private commercial services that are displaying such things as the atrocities in Bucha, things like that, that really, uh, even if you see it on the screen, it's, it's just hard to believe, but having so many sources of verification has made this war unlike any other. Ms. Wilkerson. Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, we are certainly focused on the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Uh, as I noted, uh, we are monitoring the situation very closely and we're sharing intelligence with partner nations that are engaged in joint missions to address the Ukraine crisis. Uh, we are providing um, the breadth uh, and leveraging the breadth of imagery that is available to us, uh, not only from a national perspective, but also from commercial. Thank you so much. Uh, the first uh, questioner on the member side will be Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Mr. Qu uh, Chairman, and I have two questions, and then uh, we can keep moving along here. Uh, Lieutenant General Gutlein, how are we improving the resilience of our systems, and what role does disaggregation play in strengthening our architectures? Thank you, Congressman. That, that's a, a great question. Uh, resiliency is uh, actually critical to guarantee the capability that is going to be there in uh, crisis or in uh, a conflict. Uh, resiliency, however, is not a one-time buy. It's, it's a lifetime for the system, and it comes in many, many different flavors. Uh, part of that is through redundancy, disaggregation, proliferation, hybrid architectures, a mix of organic, uh, allied, and commercial uh, systems. Uh, disaggregation is, is absolutely critical 
to, to going forward. We can know, you know, we, we started off putting an enormous amount of capability on one satellite because launch vehicles cost so much. Uh, that was during a time of peace. We can no longer do that. So going forward, we have to disaggregate those capabilities to make sure that they can survive and that it's not just one target for the adversary. Over. And thank you. Uh, and for you and Dr. Plum, a study released last year that was commissioned by the Space Force Defense Innovation Unit and Air Force Research Laboratory found that China has cornered and is now dominating the global space market. The report recommends that the United States develop new market-enhancing tools to enhance and grow American commercial space activities. What policies and new capabilities do you plan to advocate for in order to promote a more dynamic domestic space marketplace, and where are these reflected in this year's budget request? As you talked about with the commercial market, there's a lot, enormous amount of benefit that comes with commercial, uh, as well as some cautionary tales. Uh, first of all, what we've done at, uh, within the Space Force is we stood up the uh, SSC front door. So we have provided a one-stop shop for all of our commercial partners, whether that be a small startup business or all the way to our primes. So they now have one number, one uh, email address, one website to go to, and that we will paint the path to uh, opportunities depending on what they're offering uh, uh, to bring to the table. As far as what we've invested, uh, space domain awareness is continuing to grow. Uh, we spent $135 million on space domain awareness in the past four years. Uh, the SATCOM arena, that's our biggest investment area. We spent $2.3 billion just over the last two years investing in commercial SATCOM. Uh, satellite command and control is a, is a new emerging area. We invested $22 million in there uh, last year. Uh, the next emerging one is going to be uh, ISR, uh, and we're just starting to do uh, studies to determine how much ISR we can buy from space, and we're actually going to do it in a reverse industry day to ask industry what they can bring to the table uh, in that domain. Over. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Lamborn. Oh, uh, Mr. Bolton. Wait, uh, Dr. Plum was going to finish. The okay. That. Sorry. Uh, just real. Go ahead, Dr. Sure. Plum. I just, I just would add uh, one other piece. I think uh, that I'm interested in, at least, is uh, the range of the future and making sure that we are not constrained by uh, launch constraints to make sure we can fully enable our commercial and and DoD market. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moulton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to defer my questions to the classified session. Okay, then Mr. Brooks. Sir, he's left the WebEx, so next would be Mr. Okay. DeCharlie. Mr. Carvajal. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. DeCharlie is before me. Okay, well, uh, Mr. DeCharlie then. Thank you. Uh, I guess to speak for Dr. Plum, Scalise, or uh, General Geitlin, we've heard a lot about tactically responsive space. Um, what timelessness constitutes tactically, tactically responsive, and how does that timeliness uh, match the current ability of the NSSL providers to launch satellites into orbit? Thank you, Congressman. So tactically responsive space really doesn't have a specific timeline. It's mission, it's mission focused. Uh, currently, the Secretary of the Air Force has seven operational imperatives or studies that he has ongoing. One of those is the space order of battle. Under the space order of battle, we are working to determine which type of capabilities need to be, res be responsive and what ty type of timelines, and if they can be gap fillers or if they have to be long range, uh, long term uh, solutions. Uh, NSSL was not designed for tactically responsive space. It was respons re, uh, designed to get our national assets in orbit. Those national assets typically take a long time to develop. They take a, lo a lot of uh, national treasure to uh, uh, build, and therefore they require a much more methodic mission assurance process that is not uh, conducive to tactically responsive space. Okay. Do you feel comfortable with our quick launch capability if needed today or in the near future? So there is numerous small launch providers that are just starting to uh, emerge. Uh, I believe within the next 24 months, we will have that ability as, as a nation. Where are the primary launch sites located and how many do we have? Our primary launch sites are Vandenberg, California on the West Coast and Cape Canaveral on the East Coast. Is there any concern uh, that in an all-out war scenario, China or Russia could target these sites and hinder our launch, space launch capabilities, especially in, in light of the hypersonic glide advancements? Yes, sir. That is a, a concern of ours every day. Uh, we are currently at the request of Congress submitting the range of the future 
uh, congressional report. That congressional report outlines many areas of investment in infrastructure and resiliency to ensure that our space uh, launch bases will be there in a time of conflict or crisis. Okay, shifting quickly, OPIR, uh, to what extent is there a backup plan to provide missile warning if the first block zero satellite for the next generation overhead persistent infrared system cannot be launched by fiscal year 2025? Yes, sir. The current constellation of OPIR satellites is healthy. Uh, we currently have one more to launch. GEO-5 was just brought into operations a couple months ago. It is doing exceptionally well. Uh, GEO-6 uh, is, is currently uh, uh, on the ground in storage. Uh, we can launch it at any moment uh, as needed. So that constellation is extremely healthy. And then we just started the missile warning, missile track, missile defense uh, force design, which will get after resilient missile warning, missile track, missile defense architecture for the future. Does the current budget request to fund and provide sufficient resources uh, for the Block Zero program and to, to meet the schedule and performance goals? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Uh, I think we have a fair amount of time before the next, before a vote, it's probably a half hour, 45 minutes, so, uh, right? Um, but, but I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I'll yield. Thank you, Mr. Desjardins. Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Gutlein, an Inspector General report published in January audited the Department's maintenance of space launch equipment and facilities. It found that the ranges too often did not have spare parts for mission-critical range item components and were forced to search for spare parts on commercial websites such as eBay. As the Space Force reported in 2021, the U.S. commercial launch industry is on the cusp of a 60 to 100 percent increase in launch rates over the next five years. So we need to address the identified range infrastructure and maintenance needs now. How will the range of future initiative address range of the future initiative address the sustainment shortcomings to meet the expected increased demand? Sir, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that question. Maintaining our ranges is a, is a national asset, and guaranteeing assured access to space is absolutely critical to, for us to maintain the, the, the space uh, resiliency. Uh, going forward, uh, the, the current launch ranges were built uh, in the 60s. Uh, that infrastructure was built for an o a government only customer. Uh, since then, the pace of commercial change has not matched, been, been matched by the amounts nor the types of reimbursement, uh, leading to a drain on sustainment and modification funds. Uh, remedy uh, is better uh, rules and authorities, uh, not more uh, U.S. government dollars. Uh, under the range of the future, what we are asking for uh, is a change to the way we approach our architecture, our infrastructure, our operational practices, and our spaceports, as well as recommending a few changes to the national law that would enable us to better invest in our ranges. Thank you. Mr. L Ludwigson, one aspect GAO has been reviewing and this subcommittee is tracking is how to, the stand up and organization of the Space Force will address longstanding concerns that space acquisition leadership is fragmented. Can you highlight the progress the Space Force has made in this past year in addressing this concern and where the Space Force is still struggling with making progress? Uh, thank you, sir. As, as you may recall, in 2016, we raised concerns about fragmentation. This is the report that, that spoke to the 60 organizations that were involved in, in constituting um, a, a space acquisition, could be involved in a space acquisition. Uh, the stand-up of the Space Force was, I think, in some ways responsive to the concerns we raised. The, the consolidation that happens as part of the stand-up of the Space Force addresses a good number of our concerns. We haven't done a detailed examination on uh, all of the progress that's been made, but certainly bringing together many of the entities of those 60 was a uh, significant progress from our standpoint. Uh, but there's still going to be communications that are necessary with, with NRO, some of, the, uh, some of the services and other entities in order to make sure that the sort of end-to-end -end capability that is part of that, uh, the space capabilities, a variety of space capabilities comes, comes to fruition. On a grade A through F, what, how would you grade the progress in addressing that fragmentation? Uh, I, I think that we are heartened with the progress that's been made. I think um, I've had some re uh, really good conversations with No you. A through F, just heartened. Oh, um, uh, I'm heartened. Uh, I, I would say that I, I'd say that they are, All right. they're, they're, that, a B, that's good. they're a B striving for an A. That's right. we'll, we'll have to it's good to strive, but it's also good to know where we're at, and you're not telling me, so thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Wilkerson and Dr. Scolise, we have seen the tremendous benefit to open source satellite imaging throughout Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine through tracking Russian troop movements to documenting horrific war crimes. How are you both working with allied and partner nations to ensure sustained access and utilization of satellite imagery during crisis situations? Thank you for the question. So uh, from an NGA perspective, we are implementing tasking and collection strategies that look to ensure that we're maximizing the number of relevant uh, images that are collected for analysis. Um, we are certainly working with partner nations as well to ensure that that information is shared across partner nations as well as security organizations that are involved in this joint mission. And, and I would just add that uh, we work very closely with NGA to make sure that uh, with the commercial imagery contracts that we have, that uh, we're making sure that they're, they're looking at the right things and providing the information that's needed so that we can distribute it. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Carvajal and Mr. Garamendi. I'll save my questions for the uh, classified. Mr. Desjardins, did you want to ask some more questions? Or, or Mr. Langevin, I see you on the screen there. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for the testimony today. Um, if I could, uh, for uh, Dr. Plum and uh, uh, General Gutland, um, so to continue to be a global leader when it comes to new and innovative technologies, uh, it, it would behoove us to, to think not about acquiring planes and satellites that, that uh, happen to run software, but rather um, uh, that we are acquiring software that just so happens to run uh, on a plane or, or a satellite. So um, this is a, 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 an argument that I've been uh, you know, really strongly making that uh, we need to put software first and, and hardware as a, as, a, as, a, as a secondary as opposed to what we do right now. And we have to prioritize acquiring and developing new and innovative uh, software uh, effectively. So uh, to both of you, what uh, efforts are underway to overcome the barriers uh, of acquiring new and, and innovative software? Thank you, Congressman. So on, in the software arena, we have stood up what we call Kobayashi Maru, which is our DevSecOps uh, environment. Uh, it is built on the, the leading edge principles that we are learning from uh, uh, other software factories like Kessel, Kessel Run. In addition to that, we are building out the guardians uh, to, to all, every guardian to learn how to be a, a programmer so that we can rapidly uh, update and upgrade our systems along the way uh, in near real time without having to rely on a lengthy uh, development cycle. Uh, on the uh, fragmentation part, I would uh, say we have been embracing the partnerships of our international allies and our commercial partners. Uh, we stood up the International Affairs Office, uh, which currently has 15 different partnerships, and we've done the same thing with commercial. And under the Joint All Domain Command and Control in the Air Force's version of ABMS, it all becomes about how to better integrate and network the capabilities that we have, uh, and that's going to come through software first, hardware second, and that's actually going to drive the way we uh, fight in the future. Very good. I'm glad you addressed uh, the JADC2 part of it because that was going to be a part of my follow-up. Uh, but, uh, uh, okay, uh, if we could go to, uh, to Dr. Plum or uh, Mr. Lewitson, you either have anything to offer? Uh, Congressman, I think that uh, the general covered it uh, pretty well. I'll just say related to, in fact, the hearing uh, from yesterday, uh, similar issue about acquisition and making sure that innovative solutions are able to get into DOD programs. And I think, uh, I actually do believe Space Systems Command in particular is working really hard on that. So I think we're in the right trend line. Okay. Uh, so, um, so let me ask you to uh, uh, Dr. Plum, or Lieutenant uh, General uh, Gutland. Uh, it's obviously it's extremely critical to our national security that our space systems and capabilities integrate uh, best cybersecurity practices. So uh, how would you characterize our uh, cyber posture when it comes to uh, our uh, space-based systems and platforms? Uh, General, may we start with you? I'm 
sorry. Uh, our cyber capabilities today are fledgling. Uh, they're just really starting to pick up. Uh, we have invested uh, about $11 billion in this uh, president's budget to get after cyber defense. Uh, within the Space Force, we have fielded a set of new, ta new capabilities for uh, cyber defense that are both in band and out of band. And we've stood up a brand new cyber defense team that primarily right now is, is uh, protecting and defending the Sivers weapon system. We are proliferating that model across the race to the Space Force to get after the mission systems, uh, but we still have a ways to go. If, uh, if it's all right, uh, Sarah, just to add, I, I think space and cybersecurity are uh, very important to my portfolio in particular. It's a thing I've been thinking a lot about. I think uh, early cybersecurity for satellites was just based on I have a wall, a perimeter, and you can't get through. And I think the right way to approach cybersecurity for space systems is we need defense in depth. You basically have to assume there may be uh, untoward actors in your systems, and how do you make sure that you are tracking that, uh, not just at an outer shell, uh, but all the way through your systems. Very good. Well, I'll, I know my time's about to expire, so I'll stop there, but it's absolutely critical that we bake in cybersecurity measures from the inception of our systems and platforms so that we don't have to layer uh, it on top later. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Langevin. Um, it's my understanding that Mr. Desjardins will go next, and it's also my understanding that they have moved up votes. So the intent would be after Mr. Desjardins to uh, adjourn the hearing um, and then have the classified session start after votes have completed on the floor. So if that's all right with my colleagues, uh, we'll hear from Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, for the panel, throughout and even prior to the invasion of Ukraine, we saw Russia successfully utilize jamming to degrade GPS capabilities uh, throughout the region. How has Russia been utilizing these jamming capabilities against Ukraine, and have they been utilizing them against any U.S. assets? Uh, Congressman, I think we'd like to punt that to the classified okay. session. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Let's see, let's, uh, Dr. Plum or, or General Guideline, we have seen China's impressive ability to blur the lines between uh, benign space capabilities and those that may have utility as counter space weapons. The most recent example being China's uh, SJ-21 satellite that has engaged in some maneuvers that have raised some red flags. How do you assess these Chinese space threats and how is, this, uh, how is the department interacting with these capabilities? Uh, so I'll take a first shot there, Congressman. I'll just say uh, SJ-21 and other capabilities uh, China has uh, put in space or keeps on the ground. There are some dual-use situations there where you could say these are weapons or these are, uh, you know, s civilian or civil service or some type of maintenance situation. These are uh, problematic. I think this is where, one, we need to be uh, eyes wide open on the threat that China poses, and I know this committee and this panel is fully uh, aware of that. Uh, and second, it does speak to the need for uh, some beginning towards developing norms of behavior in space. Uh, just related to this, I have heard that the Russians at one time wanted to claim that the uh, robotic arm attached to the space shuttle was a weapon because it could grapple a satellite. And so you can see that this is a conversation that really requires bringing folks to the table and trying to understand and. And, and have correct behavior so we know when it's weaponized. Okay. Uh, Mr. Scalise, we'll, we'll finish with you, I guess. Uh, in February, you issued a warning for commercial and government satellites urging satellite operators to ensure that your systems are secure and that they're watching them very closely. Can you share with the committee what prompted you to issue this warning, and have we seen any aggressive actions toward U.S. government or commercial satellites since this warning? Uh, sir, I'm not sure I'm familiar with with that, um, I, I do recall at a uh, at a conference, I was I was asked if we should be prepared, and I said yes. It's much better to be prepared than to be surprised. Uh, but I did not issue any official warnings. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I'll be after my staffer. Um, <laughs> what does your <laughs> what does your collaboration with uh, uh, your collaboration with General? Uh, Nakasone look like in assessing and combating uh, cyber threats, or is that not you either? Well, we, we certainly work with, with him, uh, obviously, at, uh, at Cyber Command and, and NSA. 
Um, he provides us with uh, a lot of information that all of us use in, in uh, securing our systems. Okay. Might be a good place to stop. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Desjardins. Do any of other, my colleagues have a, a, an urgent question they would like to bring up in an urgent open session? If not, then uh, the subcommittee will recess uh, for votes and will resume in closed session after votes have been completed. I would like to thank all the witnesses and my colleagues. It's a very important subject matter, and I'm glad that uh, we're covering it. Thank you so much. The subcommittee is recessed.